Uh, we're in Hebrews uh, chapter 1 tonight. We finished the introduction last time, so we're going to start uh, this time with uh, verse 5. And I'm going to look it up on my phone here because the print is a little bigger. And my eyes have failed over the years. But that's what we're promised, right? We slowly fail until we get our brand new body. Okay, let me just read these next few verses right to the end of the chapter. Interestingly, uh, this uh, writer here, we aren't sure who his, what his name was. Could have been Paul. More likely Barnabas, I think. These uh, scriptures just don't read kind of like Paul's other letters. So, But it's a great book. And uh, he loved the Psalms. In fact, in this uh, last part of the chapter here, Kind of like my wife. My love, wife's favorite book is the Psalms, and maybe his was because he quotes from scattered Psalms uh, six times out of seven quotes. And he, and he says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, that word again is important. It's a prophetic word that refers to the second coming. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits, and that's probably, it could equally be winds there, makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God. What did he just call him there? O God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Companions, another very important Uh, word to this book of Hebrews. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, and now he repeats how he began in verse 5, this same sentence, sit at my right hand till I make your, foot, uh, your enemies your footstool. So twice he repeats that phrase, to which of the angels has he ever said? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will, and key words again, inherit salvation? Okay, let's pray. And Lord, tonight we think especially of our dear pastor and his family tonight as they grieve still and mourn the loss of a loved one. Be with them during this hour, sometimes very chaotic with all kinds of people around, but uh, you can be their strength. And we call on you to be that today and help them through these difficult days and even into future days. Your word is wonderful to us. It's, uh, it's like honey to our lips. It's, it's wonderful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces us, Lord. And let it pierce us tonight. And Holy Spirit, do a great work through your scripture, your beautiful scriptures. And uh, even this broken vessel who's speaking forth a word or two tonight, may I ask for your help as well. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray, amen. Some time ago, a woman was uh, bitten by a dog. 
that was suspected of having rabies. And while she was being treated in the hospital, she was attended by an intern who considered it his duty to explain to uh, her the seriousness of her situation. He told her they were waiting for some test results so they could uh, know whether or not she had been infected. She asked quite a few questions, and by the end of the interview, the, inter the, the uh, intern had succeeded in leaving this woman rather shaken. Later, when he came by to look at her, he found her sitting on the side of her treatment table writing, and she paused for a bit, and then she'd write some more. The young doctor was sure that he had upset her so much that maybe she was writing her will or perhaps some funeral instructions. And so he went and tried to comfort her, and he asked if she was writing her will. Oh, no, she said. Just in case I've been infected, I'm making a list of the people I want to bite before I die. <laughs> now, I don't know if this uh, woman was a believer or not. Uh, she could have been. She had enemies, just like you and me tonight. Believers down through the centuries have had enemies. That single word, enemy, is one of the most popular words in the Psalms. That's probably one of the reasons why it's quoted so often in the verses we just read. Time after time, you'll hear the psalmist, often David, uh, say such things as, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for you in God. He said, it's like an army of 10,000 people setting themselves against me all around. He said to God, Arise, O Lord, save me. Strike my enemies in the cheekbone. Break their teeth. Or as the woman might say, bite them. Give them rabies. Who are our enemies today? Who are those who would set themselves up against a man who wants to live godly in Jesus Christ? Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that we wrestle together against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Matthew chapter 13 reminds us that we have an enemy who likes to sneak around sowing tares in among the wheat. It identifies this enemy as the devil. The same enemy who, according to 1 Peter, walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Paul hinted at some of these very human enemies we have when we, he talked about all those enemies of all righteousness who pervert the ways of the Lord. He said that in Acts chapter 13. In Philippians 3, he mentions some enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. According to James, even believers can be enemies when they want to be on friendly terms with the world. Such believers can be very divisive. They can stir up little wars within the body of Christ. And by doing it, they make themselves, we're told, the enemies of God. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about death as an enemy. And I tend to think that we would be legitimate in including that in this category that we're listing here. Let's face it, we have many enemies. Believers reside today as aliens in enemy territory. The world is an enemy. The world's ruler is an enemy. The world's subjects are enemies. Why, believers often discover that they themselves are sometimes their very worst enemy. As that fleshly nature rises up to war against all that pleases God, we've been there, all of us, haven't we? Make no mistake about it, we are surrounded by enemies. Enemies whose number one delight is to leave us bruised and bloody on the field of battle. 
It's exactly where some first century believers found themselves. Various attacks had punched them black and blue. They'd been stricken, smitten, boxed, clobbered, cuffed, clipped, pelted, walloped. And as far as they were concerned, they'd had it. They were fed up, and they were through. The white flag of surrender was being hoisted. They were going to give up, and they were going to get out while they, could, while they still had opportunity to do so. Hebrews was the book in our Bible that was uh, written to stop that defection. It was designed to stem the flood and flank the thinning ranks with incentives to stick it out, persevere. Repeatedly, the writer blows a trumpet blast of warning, don't drift away, don't neglect so great salvation, don't harden your hearts, don't fall away, don't become sluggish. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't become weary and discouraged. Don't refuse him who speaks. The warnings rumble and they crack and they blare with those clashes of warning, trying to bring fleeing saints back to their spiritual senses. But in between those crashes and blares of warning, the writer in more gentle tones, seeks to bring them back, these fleeing saints, bring them back to their spiritual senses. He offers a parade of encouragement. Actually, these verses are a parade of encouragement tonight. How do we deal with the problem of enemies? Scripture answers that question in different ways. If our enemies are satanic, we're told to resist, wearing the full armor of God. If our enemies are people, we're told to overcome their evil with good. If our enemies are uh, things, we're told to accept them with joy. But underlying each of those responses is the overarching message of these verses for us tonight, and it is simply this. All the enemies of our coming king are doomed. Someday, you see, our king is going to possess all. Everything will be his, and that includes his enemies. And if we listen carefully to these few verses in Hebrews, they're going to teach us some valuable things concerning the great, unavoidable, inevitable, all the enemies of our coming king are doomed. They're done for. They are destined for assured destruction. Someday everything is going to be his, our king's. We were introduced to God's Son, Jesus Christ, in our last lesson together. And in that prologue, he was presented from a threefold vantage point of past, present, and future. In the past, he created all things. In the present, he sustains all things. And in the future, he will ultimately possess all things. The writer constructs his arguments as kind of a threefold three-post, really, barricade uh, designed to keep believers from quitting and giving up in their spiritual journey. And now in our passage this evening, the writer takes the third of those three and builds a fortress on top of it because the Lord Jesus came to this earth because he obeyed even to the point of death, the death whereby he purged our sins, mentioned there earlier, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. This was his inheritance. This was his reward. And verse 5 of our passage for this evening supplies the details. It's our first major point. Verse 5 records the ascendancy of the Son. We're introduced to the formal disclosure of what amounts to be a very grand moment that we are allowed to peek into just a little bit in these, 
which is the first of seven quotes that's selected by our author from the Old Testament. This one's from Psalm 2, and it says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. What's the official name? The name given above every name? It's the name Son. No enemy can expect to compete successfully against a name like that. Even the mightiest of angels pales into insignificance. This is the preeminent, transcendent name. You are my son. A great name. A great honor. The background of Psalm 2, where we're told this name, envisions enemy nations in rebellion against the Lord. And what does the Lord do? If you know anything about that psalm, you'll recall right away he laughs. He holds his side, if you can picture the scene, and, and roars from the humor of it all. He glances down at all of these puny little enemies, and he says, Today I'm setting my king on my holy hill of Zion. All he has to do is ask, and I will give him every last rebel nation so he can break them in pieces just like uh, an iron rod would shatter a clay pot. He's my son. Now, of course, the Lord Jesus has always been the Son of God. From all eternity, he's worn that title, but there is a unique sense in which he inherited that name at a specific point of time. The quote says, today, today. And the verb which follows that demands a particular point of time with a continuance from that point. And if you glance back at verse 3, you discover that point, that historical moment when our Lord Jesus, following his ascension, took his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. And on that day, he could say to his father, Father, I have done everything necessary to become king of the world. All the prerogatives of king became his at that point of time. And as heaven held its collective breath, Jesus assumed the name Son. It's a moment that reminds our author of a second quote from the Old Testament. This one from Samuel chapter 7, where God establishes an eternal covenant with King David. And upon David's throne would inevitably sit one of whom it would be said, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The sense of the word son, then, that the author in Hebrews has in mind is the Davidic sense that kingly line of David. This son is a king, an heir to the eternal throne of his father, David. So what are the privileges and prerogatives of that sonship? Why, why would the father say this to his Davidic son? Would he... Uh, would he like all those nations, he's asked, those rebel empires that are lifting up their puny little fingers and fists against me? Would he like them for his very own? He would. Well, then you can have them. Crush them. Rule them with a rod of iron. You've earned the right to take dominion over all things. And now, as if anticipating that very time, Hebrews 1 and verses 6 through 12 ignore many centuries of time from that ascension that we just saw to the very climax of the ages when our God, according to the words of verse 6, again brings his firstborn into the world. That word again, quoted from Psalm 97 this time, is prophetic. It's his second coming. He's coming again. He's going to crush his enemies as he puts his glory on display before all mankind. So Psalm 97 then joins Psalm 2 in advancing this major theme 
of the Son crushing all of his enemies. Notice our author's words to that effect in verse 5 of chapter 2. He says, the things we're talking about concern the world to come when the king will defeat all of his enemies. It's obvious then that we're moving in verse 6 from the time of our Lord's ascension when he officially was given the name Son and told to sit in highest honor at his Father's right hand to that future moment when the king's son finally asks to be given the rebel nations of the earth. And it introduces us to the second major point of our passage, the authority of the son. The very name son affords him some guarantees. The writer mentions three of them in these verses. They begin in verses 6 and 7 with the fact that he will reign supreme over angels. Now, I'd be the first to admit uh, this evening that the mere mention of something like that uh, maybe falls a little flat on 20th century ears. When we think of power and superpower, our imaginations relate to the world of our experience, and we focus on things like nuclear destruction and, and the terrible threat of armed missiles staring at us from afar. Now, that's power. That's muscle you and I can relate to. Or consider the occasional freak of nature, perhaps that tornado or that earthquake, forces that swallow up huge chunks of a city as though they were nothing but mere bites from a cookie. Or, or what about those men in high places? Those men who pull the strings of the world. What about those magnates who command millions and billions and trillions of dollars? The very beck and call of history seems to cater to such men. Who can compete against power like that? And yet, when the Bible thinks of muscle and might, it shoves all of that aside, all of those familiar images, hinting that they are less than nothing in comparison to the unseen spirit world of principalities and powers. It tells us of a vast heavenly spiritual dimension that, that is the real force behind the more obvious and familiar forces that we face in our present world. It's a world of angels, angels who command and control the energies of nature, angels who rule over the rulers of nations. And what's to be said of these angelic powers on that future day when God the Father brings his king, king son back into the world for the second time? The writer of the book of Hebrews draws forward two Old Testament quotes again, both of which thrust us toward that final climactic moment when God moves upon this earth in a full revelation of glory to crush his enemies. And what about those mighty angels at such a time as that? Well, notice the angels of God worship the Son. He's surrounded by them. Thousands upon thousands times ten thousands. And they bow in adoring worship at His feet. They go forth from His throne to do His will like swift winds like devouring fire. They blend with the elemental forces of nature to carry out the wishes of the Son. At His word, they march against His enemies. What's to be said of that coming day as far as angels are concerned? While the Son reigns supreme, the angels serve and worship. But notice the second of these guarantees associated with this name, Son. With another Old Testament quote, we're told in verses 8 and 9 that this Son will rejoice eternally in righteousness. If you look it up there in Psalm 45, you'd read of God, the King, who girds his sword on his thigh and rides forth in majesty with arrows sharp in the heart of, and he uses the word, his enemies. And while the writer of Hebrews doesn't quote it all, 
implicit in this and all the other quotes that we're looking at until he reaches a very explicit climax later on in verse 13 is the anticipation of the Son's ultimate victory over every enemy. Of the Son, it's said here in verse 8, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. It's a verse that expands our understanding of the identity of this king son. He's addressed as God, and his righteous rule will spare no enemy. What a cheering world for those in a world so hell-bent on unrighteousness. When the Israelite of old went to the marketplace to buy a pound of wheat, it was a familiar practice to take along with him not a 16-ounce weight, but a 17-ounce weight to put on the other side of the scale. And when he was selling the wheat, he had a 15-ounce weight that he used. He had one, for, one in each one of his pockets, and out would come one at the appropriate weight and one at the other appropriate, one for buying, one for selling. Well, the reign of this king's son will not be like that. It will conform exactly to the standard. And not just any standard. The standards of society vary with the prevailing winds of opinion as they change from generation to generation. And quite often they bear little resemblance to the actual thing. We certainly see that in our age today. Many times we don't even sense it ourselves because just like a fish, it doesn't feel he's wet. We're so immersed in what we're, what's around us that we don't even notice how far off many times the mark of the world has drifted. The environment of this future king will be perfect. He will rule in absolute righteousness deviating from the standard by not so even much as a hair's breadth. And where did he earn the right to rule like that? He earned it as a man here on earth when he served his heavenly Father perfectly. He hated lawlessness, we're told, perfectly. He hated, he, he loved righteousness perfectly. And because of that, God the Father at his second coming is going to pour out on him like a fragrant ointment, joy and gladness unsurpassed. After all, as the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, it was because of the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross and the hostility of sinners. And now that experience of joy becomes his, a joy that exceeds the joy of his companions. He's going to have them, of course, companions. It's not at all by chance that the writer of this book extends his quotation of Psalm 45 to include that final word, companions, and then he stops. Very deliberately, he lets us know that this king is going to have companions in his joy. In fact, these companions become the focus of much of the book of Hebrews, and fittingly so. After all, all kings back in those days had companions. And they were often appointed to high positions in his kingdom, elevated to power along with the king because they had helped their king along the way. They had stuck it out with him. They'd been faithful to the end with their king. And it was appropriate then for a first century reader to think that one whose throne would be forever and ever would also have a close circle of friends at his side to participate in his joy. That was true of every king. The Greek word here is metakoi, and it signifies a close friend, a companion, a, a buddy. The word is used in Luke chapter 5 and verse 7 of Peter who is fishing with his metakoi, his close friends, those with whom he spent most of his time. But were there kings who also had metakoi? In fact, yes. This word metakoi was used when, in the first century, uh, in which the, the book of Hebrews itself was written, in some very telling ways. For example, 
King Rehoboam, an Old Testament king, had metakoi. The Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Old Testament during the time of Christ, tells us that King Rehoboam had an inner circle of metakoi in his cabinet. They were the young men he'd grown up with, with whom he was familiar, his friends, and he came to power with them. King Herod, we're told, had metakoi. When Ken Herod assumed power, he brought his intimate friends along with him, his metakoi, to share in his power. Julius Caesar, we discover, had them. He surrounded himself with his metakoi, those who had stuck it out with him, those who had faithfully helped bring him to power. It would seem very appropriate, then, to a first century reader of the book of Hebrews, that the one whose throne is going to be forever and ever, as king of the entire world, would also have his own circle of close friends. Luke chapter 22 and verse 26 through 30, Jesus said to his disciples, You are those who have continued with me in my trials. You are those who will eat with me and drink with me at my table in my kingdom. They would be his metakoi. And the book of Hebrews opens that honor up to an even wider group. Who are the companions of this king? Certainly not angels. This king came to earth as a man, and so his partners, his companions, his friends, would also be men. In fact, this offer of partnership goes out to every born-again believer in the family of God. Our writer is going to use that very same word again in chapter 3 in verse 1. When he tells us, Therefore, holy brethren, they're part of the family of God, clearly. Therefore, holy brethren, partners, there's the word, partners of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus. It's an unmistakable offer of partnership with Jesus Christ in a kingdom, His kingdom, that would never be shaken. Think of it. Can there be any Christian, can there be any Christian here tonight who is not moved by the prospect of an offer like that? It's amazing why there must be a bunch of us here who who would jump at that opportunity. What's the catch? Surely there's a catch, isn't there? And yes, I admit it. There is something that might be construed as a catch. For in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 14, we discover that very same word again, metakoi. And this time it's in a verse which says, we have become partners of Christ, metakoi of Christ, if... If, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. It says if. You see, this writer is writing to believers who were tempted to give up. We mentioned that last time. They were tempted to let their church attendance slide. They were tempted to turn their backs on their Christian faith. And our writer says, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Please don't throw away your confidence. Don't don't you see that if you do, you'll be throwing away your partnership, your opportunity of friendship with the coming king. Of course, we know how we become his friends, don't we? We are his friends if we do what he tells us. You see, in the Christian life, there are some undeniable certainties. But there are also some clear conditions. And while I am certain and absolutely sure that I am a believer and that I possess eternal life that will never, ever be taken away, and while there's not even the slightest doubt in my mind that I will live forever in the presence of God, partnership is something in addition to that. Something different from that. Eternal life is a gift. Completely free. 
absolutely free. But partnership is something I must work for and hold on to. Eternal life can never be lost, ever. But partnership can. And my only guarantee of partnership in that coming kingdom with Jesus Christ is to make certain from day to day in my walk with God that I continue in my commitments firm unto the end. And if I do, as the Lord Jesus himself says in the book of the Revelation, he who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to the end of his life, To him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the potter's vessels shall be broken in pieces. Jesus extends to his partners, his metakoi, his companions, the same promise his father extended to him in Psalm 2. They can reign with him. They can reign with him in his coming kingdom. The beautiful music really, that we all are familiar with, of Handel's Messiah, reminds us of that glorious hallelujah chorus with its series of descending notes that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And then the music moves suddenly upward and we hear, and He shall reign forever." And ever and over and over and over it repeats and he shall reign forever and ever and he shall reign forever and you know it right you've heard it it's true he's going to what a marvelous guarantee promised to the son who bears the name son and who also bears the name king he will rejoice eternally in righteousness over his enemies and at his side At his side will be companions, friends, partners who will share his joy. But then we come to that last great guarantee in verses 10 through 12, quoting again from a psalm that declares ultimate victory for this king's son over all of his enemies. The writer quotes just that portion which reminds us that he will remain the same How long? Forever. Now, we are painfully aware of our own mortality. And yet, even we outlast many suits of clothes. How many times I've had to go and buy a new pair of jeans because the old ones wore out. And in contrast to those old jeans, what are some of the things that we tend to think of as enduring, lasting forever? Creation? The heavens? The earth? Isn't that the same old stuff that's been around for thousands of years? And yet these verses liken that good old faithful earth with its good old faithful sun, moon, and stars to that old pair of jeans. And just like one man in a lifetime outlives many pairs of jeans, so the Son of God is going to outlive and outlast this old universe and he'll do it unchanged. When I have to buy that new pair of jeans, I've changed from one pair to the next. (laughs) I've gone downhill. But the Son of God, the psalmist writes, you are the same, and your years will not fail. He's going to outlast it all. And my friend, that includes all of those enemies that seem so prominent, so menacing today. I challenge you. Try to think of even so much as one enemy you face. One major difficulty. Pick out the very worst, if you wish. Will any of them outlast our king? His future guarantees that he will remain the same forever. They will perish He will remain. Jesus outlasts his creation. After he rules here for a thousand years on the old creation, this creation will be replaced with another one. And the point is, Christ's kingdom is going to survive that. What great news for these original readers who were opening this letter for the very first time. Their enemies were done for. Their problems were temporary. 
Don't give up. Your friendship with, will, with Jesus will outlast it all. As the old folk song said, there's a tree in paradise. The pilgrims call it the tree of life. All my troubles, Lord, will soon be over. There's an eternal kingdom just ahead. And that brings us to the final aspect of our passage that it develops concerning this king's son. We've, we've seen the ascendancy of the son when he gained the very name son. We've seen the authority of the Son, and now, even ever so briefly, we're going to consider the apex of the Son. It's the climax, really. In verses 13 and 14, the apex is, is what? It's the, it's the highest point of something. The summit, the peak, the very tip-top. And the author alerts us to it by carefully repeating the same words. I think we pointed that out as we read those words. He repeats the same words he used at the beginning of verse 5, and he repeats them again, having gone full circle. His argument's complete. Implicit through all of these verses. Let me just draw your attention that the words that, the words that were repeated were, to which of the angels has he ever said? There at the beginning of our passage, and now here at the end. They call that a figure of speech called an inclusio. In this case, it tells us that we've reached the summit. We've reached the apex of this passage. This is the high point, if you will. The exalted son is sitting, waiting for his moment. Our passage has gone full circle. His arguments are complete. Implicit through all of these verses, you trace each back one to its uh, setting, and each of them, the underlying thought is that this king's son must be victorious over all of his enemies. Let's remind ourselves of them. Psalm 2, the nations rage against the Lord and against his no anointed. Psalm 97, a fire goes out before him and burns up all his enemies. Psalm 104, many sinners may be consumed and the wicked be will be no more. Psalm 45, your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. Psalm 102, my enemies reproach me all the day long. And now, Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And of course, today he sits. Today he sits, waiting for that moment. And while he sits, he ministers. Hebrews is going to tell us he's ministering as a high priest, coming to the aid of his people, people weary from the battle, people ready to give up and quit, people to whom the enemy seems to be too much, too big. He ministers through ministering angels who are sent forth to minister on behalf of those who will inherit salvation. Those angels, in some mysterious fashion, bring with them from the very throne of God mercy and grace, we're told, to help in every time of need. They minister encouragement to stay with the winning side. Stick it out. Don't give up. In view of the ultimate triumph of the Son of God. Take courage, Christians, they say. Your enemies are the losers. They're nothing more than the king's footstool. Find comfort in knowing that one soon day your king will defeat all those who are making life hard for you today. You are the winners if you stay in step with the Son of God. You will inherit His kingdom with Him as His metakoi, His companions. And of course, this is not, oh, you will inherit salvation, He says next. Of course, this is not salvation from hell that He could possibly be talking about here. The writer whose mind is flooded with the Psalms is probably going to be using that word salvation here in a word appropriate to those Psalms where salvation is always used, often used, as salvation from deliverance or salvation from enemies, salvation from oppression. Victory, if you will. Ultimate joy for those who have earned the right to it through steadfast endurance of staying with their king right to the end of their lives. Throughout the book of Hebrews, the author understands that his readers are already believers. They already have eternal life, that free gift. 
they already have salvation from hell. The author of Hebrews is talking about something they don't have yet. And what they don't have is a stake in God's future victory. When Jesus will share his inheritance with his metakoi, his faithful companions. There's coming a day when Jesus will reward those believers who have stuck it out with him. Well, you're here tonight, so you've stuck it out so far, haven't you? Keep going. Many believe that all Christians will be equal in that coming kingdom. Not so. The Lord taught that some would rule over ten cities. Some would rule over five. Some would rule over none. The Apostle Paul taught that only those believers who stick it out, even through suffering, only those will reign with the Lord. Hebrews calls them companions, metakoi. They don't quit. They hold firm to the end of their lives. They finish well. Hebrews is going to have some warning passages along the way. And the whole purpose of those warnings will be to shake awake those who are losing their grip. The author is going to do it with words like, Folks, the king is coming. You've believed in Jesus for eternal life. Now believe in him for victory as you run the race set before you. Do the difficult thing. Don't give up. A little girl was being excluded from some family activities because of her misbehavior. And not being allowed to eat with the others, she found herself at a small table in the corner of one room. Her father gave thanks for the food, but she felt excluded from that, and so when the others had finished praying, she folded her hands and bowed her head and then said very loudly so that all could hear, I thank you, Lord, for preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> Make no mistake about it, my friends, we have enemies today. Enemies who are out to push us to the breaking point. You know them, don't you? I know them. They have one goal. They want us to give up. They want us to quit. And a lot of Christians do. But we must not be among them. Our Lord has prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Today we can nibble at that table. Tomorrow we can feast. And we can do that as the very companions of the king himself, under whose feet will be all of his enemies, if we can just hold fast to the very end, keep our confidence steadfast right to the end of our lives. That's why the songwriter has written those very appropriate words, you probably know them, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. Keep me burning till the what? Break of day. If our lamp is always burning, you and I will be partners one day with the king in his coming kingdom through all eternity. And our Lord, thank you so much for that wonderful offer. We feel our feebleness every day. We feel our lack of strength every day. We cling to you, our strength. We look to you as we run the race. We want to be victorious. We want to run victoriously right to the end, right to the very end knowing we already have eternal life that can never be taken away, but then this is on top of it. We can have this as well, this opportunity to share in your joy as the King of kings forever and ever. Keep us going, Lord. May every believer here tonight end well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.